Well, thank you, Andrew, for that very nice, if chilling, introduction. So yes, uh, the topic I'm talking on is physical indeterminism and free personal agency. This is something which has already come up several times just in the morning, first morning session of this conference. So it's obviously in many ways at the very center of discussions about science and personal agency, both human and divine. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the whole area of uh, physical indeterminism and personal agency. I'm going to talk about one specific but very influential argument. Um, so I, I think I'll start by reading the paper out in the traditional fashion, but I'll try to put in, put in some asides uh, to keep everyone awake since we've just had lunch and I'm liable to drowse off myself otherwise. <laughs> so um, the development of quantum mechanics at the start of the 20th century has had a profound influence throughout philosophy, but nowhere has this impact been more pronounced than in debates about free action. Now, from, from the 17th to the early 20th century, as has, I think, been mentioned already today, the general view was that all events follow deterministically from prior physical causes. They're made to happen by the prior causes, and that's all you can really say about what makes them happen. And that thesis is incompatible with the widespread libertarian view about free agency, according to which human persons, at least, engage in free actions, and those free actions are undetermined events, indeed have to be undetermined if they're free. Now, because on standard interpretations, it posits undetermined events, quantum, me quantum mechanics has been seen as a savior for libertarian views about free agency. It's thought that uh, quantum mechanics might provide the necessary room for free personal action. Now, I won't say why we want to be libertarians about free action. Uh, I should mention that not everyone is. There are these people called compatibilists who think that uh, you can have free agency despite determinism. Uh, this is a view which Kant famously referred to as a wretched subterfuge, and which William James once called a quagmire of evasion. Uh, I'll leave those ad hominems as my only, only objections to that. Uh, so the metaphysical implications of quantum mechanics haven't only been seen as uh, uh, being of great relevance to human action, but also for special divine action. So theorists have also appealed to physical indeterminism in order to explain the possibility of special divine action that neither suspends nor violates natural laws. Uh, and I refer to a, a Robert Russell paper uh, here in which that idea is set out perhaps uh, most significantly. Uh, this is because unlike deterministic laws, merely probabilistic constraints seem to leave room for a, a lawful divine intervention. Now, it used to be the case that libertarians, the people who think that free actions have to be undetermined, were standardly uh, objected to by appeals to physical determinism. The standard response was that, well, you can't have free actions like that because the world is deterministic. I'll, I'll define that shortly. No longer is that the case because, as all metaphysicians know, standard interpretations of quantum mechanics suggest that the physical world isn't deterministic. So it seems like an unwarranted presupposition, determinism that is, for any argument, argument against libertarianism. For this reason, there is a new argument against libertarianism, uh, a new more or less standard objection that has arisen. And this has appeared in many, many articles throughout the 20th century. It also has antecedents before then. I call this the chance argument. And I think I put it here. Uh, the chance argument. Premise one says, as is written up here, if an event is a free action, then it is not the case that it occurs by chance. Premise two is the thesis that if an event is undetermined, then it does occur by chance. And it follows validly from these two premises that if an event is undetermined, then it's not a free action. Of course, this creates a huge problem for libertarians because it seems that uh, you can't have undetermined events being free actions after all. They're either determined or undetermined. In either case, you get a free action. Perhaps there aren't free actions. It might also cause trouble for undetermined special divine actions. 
but I won't dare to uh, venture into that territory today. So uh, the chance argument has been immensely influential in philosophy of action. Uh, versions have been endorsed by compatibilists like Ari Hobart and A.J. Eyre, people who think that free action is compatible with determinism. It's been endorsed by theorists who deny the existence of free will, like Galen Strawson and Dirk Perabum. And it's also been endorsed by mysterians about free will, people who think that there is free will, but we just can't understand it, uh, such as Colin McGinn and Peter Van Inwagen. It's, so it's had a colossal effect in the philosophy of action. Now, uh, my immediate response to this argument, intuitively, was, well, why do undetermined events have to occur by chance? Uh, certainly, you know, some chance events might be undetermined if quantum occurrences are, are typically chance events. Perhaps that means they're undetermined. But it wasn't clear to me why all undetermined events have to occur by chance intuitively, introspectively. One feels that one's own free actions are undetermined, but nonetheless not chance occurrences. So the purpose of this paper is to defend the thesis that physical indeterminism of the kind posited by quantum mechanics on standard interpretations, does provide sufficient for room for free personal agency against the chance argument. And my strategy is to put pressure on the notion of chance to which the argument appeals. So the argument uses the term by chance in both premise one and in premise two. It's valid only if uh, that phrase has the same meaning in both cases, and the argument is sound if and only if there is a valid reading on which both premises are true. I've attempted, whilst writing this paper, to draw readings of this phrase, occurs by chance, from proponents of the chance argument. This isn't such an easy thing to do, because proponents of the argument frequently say very little about what they mean by chance, which is perhaps surprising, because there's actually a rich literature on chance and on randomness. Those are usually distinguished. Uh, there's a lot of room for discussion, which hasn't happened to that great uh, a degree in this area. And nevertheless, I distinguish four salient readings of by chance, each of which reflects what some proponent of the argument seems to have in mind. Okay. I should say, by the way, about the uh, beautiful pictures I've got behind the writing in this uh, uh, talk, these are entirely unrelated to the content of the talk. I was just putting it together, the slideshow on the aeroplane, and thought I'd brighten it up. Uh, uh, this is Nicolas Poussin's uh, 19, uh, 1631 painting, The Empire of Flora. Uh, I might try to make some spurious connections between them and the content as we go along, but uh, <laughs> you, you can ignore them otherwise. <laughs> so, four readings of this phrase occurs by chance. Uh, number one, an event E occurs by chance if and only if it just happens, in a sense to be defined. Number two, if it's unpredictable or in principle unpredictable. Number three, if it's governed by objective probability, and number four, if it lacks what's known as a contrastive explanation, and these will become more clear as we proceed. Uh, and these readings are drawn from classic papers by Ari Hobart and JJC Smart, the first two that is, and then from more recent works by Peter Van Inwagen and Alfred Meller for the latter, latter two. And I'm going to argue that on each reading, either premise one or premise two is intuitively false, or at the very least, lacking in persuasive support. Um, because I know there's a time limit, I might not spend equal time on uh, each version of the chance argument, corresponding to four readings. I'm most interested in reading three events uh, occur by chance if and only if they're governed by objective probability. So I might spend slightly longer on that. Uh, and Alfred Meller might fall by the wayside. We shall see. <clears throat> um, so I've set out the chance argument formally. Before proceeding, I should give a definition of determinism. And uh, lack of clarity about what we mean by determinism has already come up as a topic uh, today. So for the purposes of this paper, at least, I have been assuming that uh, determined events are those that, given the laws of nature and the history of the world prior to their occurrence, had to occur. Or more precisely, an event E at a time T is determined if and only if there exists no possible world W that shares both the laws of nature of the actual world and the history of the actual world prior to that time t, such that E does not occur at t in W. Uh, probably the previous formulation is actually uh, clearer, but uh, this puts it slightly more precisely. And an event is undetermined if and only if it isn't determined. 
uh, one consequence of that definition of determinism is that if it's merely the case that we're not able to conduct measurements such as to uh, predict an event, even if it's the case that we're not in principle able to do so, that, uh, that effect could still be determined. Uh, the fact that we can't tell whether it was possible for it to fail to happen, given the laws of nature and the history of the world, doesn't entail that in actual fact it might not have happened, given the laws of nature and the history of the world. Okay, so I'll continue to reading number one, the just happens reading. And as I've said, this is taken from a uh, classic paper uh, written by J.J.C. Smart. Uh, his paper is entitled Free... Oh, sorry, <laughs> this one is Ari Hobart. His paper is entitled Free Will as Involving Determination and Inconceivable Without It. Now, in that paper, Ari Hobart says, Now, insofar as this event is undetermined, it is born at the moment of nothing. Hence, it expresses no quality. It bursts into being from no source. So Hobart describes undetermined events which he identifies as instances of absolute chance, as bursting into being from nothing or as having no source. And this provides an initially compelling way of giving content to the notion of chance to which the chance argument appeals. Uh, I'll abbreviate this notion of bursting into being from no source uh, by using the phrase just happens, an event bursts into being from no source if it just happens. We might also, we might uh, alternatively just say it's uncaused, but then perhaps there are kinds of source which we wouldn't naturally interpret as causes. It won't make any difference for, for this discussion. So here's the chance argument written out, uh, substituting Hobart's notion of bursting into being from, from no source for the notion of occurring by chance. If an event is a free action, then it is not the case that it just happens. Two, if an event is undetermined, then it just happens. Therefore, if an event is undetermined, it is not a free action. So on this reading, premise one is the claim that if an event is a free action, then it's not the case that it just happens. I think that seems very plausible. If, for example, the raising of my arm springs out of nowhere, if it bursts into being from no source, then it's difficult to construe it as a free action of which I'm the agent. Hobart expresses this point as follows. He says, in proportion as an act of volition starts of itself without cause, it is exactly so far as the freedom of the individual is concerned as if it had been thrown, he pauses for breath there, <laughs> into his mind from without, suggested to him by a freakish demon. It is just as if his legs should suddenly spring up and carry him off where he did not prefer to go. So a proponent of the chance argument presumably might reason as follows. If an event is a free action, then it's got to be performed by some agent. If it's an action, it's got to be performed by an agent. But if an event just happens, uh, in the sense expressed by Hobart, then it seems that it at most happens to some agent from without. Uh, but it's not performed by any agent, and a fortiori, a fortiori is not a, an, an action and not a free action. So I think we can concede to the proponents of the chance argument that premise one is very plausible on the just happens reading. Premise two on this reading, however, is false. Uh, that an event is undetermined does not entail that it just happens, and at least two examples show this. First, an event that is undetermined can still have a particular cause in the past. If we suppose that a, uh, a ver vertically polarized photon, which looks rather like that, approaches a polarizer that is tilted at an angle from the vertical, right? there's a positive chance that the photon will pass through the polarizer, but also a positive chance that it will not do so. Uh, if the photon does pass through the polarizer, then it looks like that event was undetermined, because given both the laws of nature and the history of the world prior to the event, it was possible that it shouldn't occur. That does depend on a very slightly controversial principle about probability, which I won't go into here. Um, it's false, however, that the photons passing through the polarizer just happens, uh, I, that it has no source and no cause. Uh, rather, it's probabilistically caused by the photons being propelled towards the polarizer in conjunction with certain other conditions. There's a second, so it looks like premise two, uh, if an event is undetermined, it just happens isn't, isn't the case. Another way you can object to premise two on this reading is afforded by simultaneous causation. So if you suppose that an event E is of the effect of a distinct event C, 
And if you suppose that E and C occur at the same time, simultaneous causation, right? Uh, and that C, the event causing the other one, is undetermined. Well, that makes it look as though the effect is also going to be undetermined. It's at least consistent with it. Uh, that is, uh, given the prior history of the world and the laws of nature, prior to that effect, it was possible that it shouldn't happen. Uh, remembering that the cause is simultaneous with it, it's not part of the prior history of the world. But obviously this effect is a hypothesi, not one that just happens because it had a cause, a cause that was simultaneous with it. So again, it looks like premise two of the chance argument on the just happens reading is demonstrably false. Uh, and one reason for being interested in these two ways of refuting it is that they seem to correspond rough, roughly to two standard ways of trying to explain libertarian free actions. Uh, so some libertarians posit that free actions performed by humans have indeterministic causes prior to them, and some libertarians posit that they're caused by the agent in some uh, notoriously difficult to explain uh, occurrence known as agent causation. I, I think the, the former is obviously a case of indeterministic causation. The latter might bear relevant resemblances to simultaneous causation. Now, uh, perhaps a proponent of the argument might respond by arguing that free actions can't be simultaneously or probabilistically caused either, but I've not seen an argument to that effect, and it would be contrary to the views of many libertarians on the matter. And in any case, the inference from being undetermined to just happening has been defeated, so they'd need to bring in some further arguments to show why we should think that uh, undetermined events have to be ones that just happen. It seems, therefore, that there's a great deal of work to do if the arguments to get off the ground on this reading. I'll, I'll proceed now from William Turner's beautiful picture of Hannibal crossing the Alps to uh, the unpredictable reading. So where a curse by chance is read as just happens, the chance argument seems false because being undetermined doesn't entail anything so drastic as just happening. And so the proponent of the argument needs a reading of a curse by chance which makes a more modest claim about what's entailed by being an undetermined event. One candidate is suggested by a second classic presentation of the chance argument, this time it is by J.G.C. Smart, entitled Free Will, Praise and Blame. So Smart offers the following definition. He says, I shall define the view that pure chance reigns to some extent within the universe as follows. There are some events that even a superhuman calculator could not predict, however precise his knowledge of however wide a region of the universe at some previous time. Obviously, Smart's calculator is rather like Laplace's demon, which was mentioned in the previous talk. Now, it might be misleading to say that, uh, given this definition uh, for Smart, occurs by chance in the chance argument means something like is unpredictable, because Smart doesn't actually distinguish being unpredictable from being undetermined. But then it should be pointed out that if occurring by chance just means being undetermined, uh, then the first premise of the chance argument is equivalent to its conclusion, rendering it obviously question-begging. So it's more charitable to Smart to uh, interpret him as I am. Uh, in which case we can move on to assessing the two premises of the argument on this reading. So now premise one says, if an event is a free action, then it is not the case that it's unpredictable. Premise two says, if an event is undetermined, then it's unpredictable conclusion. Therefore, if an event is undetermined, it is not a free action. Well, premise two on this reading fares better than it does on the just happens reading, because there's an obvious sense in which if an event's undetermined, then it is unpredictable. Now, of course, an undetermined event can be predicted as, as a probability. Uh, if the photons passing or traveling towards the polarizer, Smart's calculator might be able to tell us how likely it is that it's going to pass through and how likely it is that it isn't. But it does seem highly plausible that no calculator, no matter what it knows about the past and the laws, could tell us for certain which one of these events is going to occur. So, so long as is unpredictable means cannot be predicted with certainty, it seems that premise one on, sorry, uh, premise two on this reading is true uh, and should be conceded to the proponent of the chance argument. The same does not hold for premise one, however. So on this reading, premise one is the claim that if an event is a free action, then it's not unpredictable. And it's difficult to see what reason a proponent of the chance argument could have for expecting the libertarian to accept this claim. The only libertarian to whom 
this version of the argument could pose a genuine threat would be one who is committed to the thesis that free actions must be predictable with certainty. And it seems very unlikely that any libertarian would take that view. In the history of philosophy, at least, the kind of foreknowledge that would be made possible by that scenario has been understood as a threat to free action and certainly not as a prerequisite for it. The locus classicus for that view is uh, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. And so it's natural to suppose that the fact that an undetermined event is unpredictable uh, counts in favor of it as a, as a candidate for free action, uh, as opposed to the contrary. So whilst where occurs by chance means is unpredictable, uh, premise two of the chance argument seems okay, premise one on this reading seems utterly question begging. So I'll now move on from these two classic papers, uh, both of which endorse a version of a chance argument, it should be said. They're not just randomly selected because they can uh, contain comments about chance. I'll move on to a more recent paper. Uh, this is Van Inwagen, Peter Van Inwagen's article entitled Free Will Remains a Mystery. Peter Van Inwagen claims to be a libertarian about free will. He just says he doesn't know how libertarianism could possibly be true. Uh, so he's a mysterian about free will. The reason he uh, can't understand how libertarianism could be true is because he finds persuasive a version of the chance argument. Uh, now, in Van Inwagen's paper, he does give a reasonably clear uh, articulation to what it is about occurring by chance that's supposed to cause trouble for free personal action. Uh, and at least as I understand him, the problem is that chance occurrences are governed by what he refers to as objective probability. So uh, Van Inwagen's paper, uh, the way he uh, introduces us to this notion of objective probability, uh, uh, occurs through a thought experiment, which, which I'll give. So we imagine that an agent, who Van Inwagen calls Alice, faces a, a dilemma, whether to lie or to tell the truth. I should move on to uh, this reading. Uh, after deliberation, Alice decides freely to tell the truth. This could be Alice in the middle, I was thinking. Her friend is asking whether she likes her painting. Her other friend is saying, well, you had better, better tell the truth about it, Alice, and she's, she's worried about upsetting her friend. Uh, this is An Angelica Kaufman's 1741 painting. I won't give the title because it refutes my hypothesis about what it depicts. <laughs> uh, so here, here we have Alice facing her dilemma, whether to lie or tell the truth. She freely tells the truth. But then God comes in and reverses the universe to precisely the state it was in one minute before Alice made her decision and allows it to run forward again. Now, Van Morgan says, well, presumably, if the action was undetermined the first time, then it's going to be undetermined the second time, uh, meaning she might tell the truth again, or she might lie. And he proposes that if we, or if God, conducts these reruns over and over again, what we're likely to see is Alice lying on some occasions, telling the truth on other occasions, and that the frequency with which she lies and tells the truth will approach some value. He suggests, for example, that she might lie on roughly half of the occasions and tell the truth on roughly the other half, but it doesn't matter what the, exact, what the uh, actual proportion is. So what Van, Van Inwagen says is that in this scenario, supposing we see Alice lie on half the occasions and tell the truth on the other half, uh, we are then obliged to assign a probability of 0 0.5 to the chance that Alice will tell the truth or lie on the next replay. And he continues, we must make this assignment because it is the only reasonable explanation of the observed approximate equality of truth and lie outcomes in the series of replays. It's the only reasonable explanation. And if we accept this general conclusion, what other conclusion can we accept about the next replay than this? Each of the two possible outcomes of this replay has an objective ground floor probability, those were Van Inwagen's quotation marks, not mine, scare quotes, has an objective ground floor, floor probability of 0 0.5 and there's nothing more to be said. And this surely means that in the strictest sense imaginable, the outcome of the replay will be a matter of chance. So Van Inwagen claims that we're obliged to explain Alice's action in terms of objective probability, probability and he equates being governed by objective probability with occurring by chance in the strictest sense imaginable. 
This allows us to put the chance argument uh, in Van in Wagen's terms. We have premise one, if an event is a free action, then it is not the case that it's governed by objective probability. Premise two, if an event is undetermined, then it's governed by objective probability, as the Alice scenario perhaps shows. Conclusion, if an event is, a, is undetermined, it is not a free action. Now, I think, which premise do I start with here? <laughs> premise one on this reading, if an event is a free action, it's not the case that it's governed by objective probability. Uh, I'll come to in a moment, but first we'll look at premise two, which I'm inclined to think, uh, again, like, like on Smart's reading, the, uh, uh, the uh, unpredictable reading, does somewhat better than it does for Hobart. Um, so there are two pivotal steps in Van der Morgen's reasoning. First, we suppose that we observe the relative frequency with which Alice lies and tells the truth, approaching some value, like 0.5. Uh, in, in Van Wagen's example. Secondly, we infer from this that the objective probability that Alice will lie or tell the truth on the next replay is equal to 0 0.5. And uh, the, this is because, according to Van Wagen, this is the only reasonable explanation of the approximate equality of lie replays and truth replays. Now, Van Wagen doesn't actually give any justification for the first of those two pivotal steps. He doesn't tell us why it's the case that we should see these lie replays and uh, truth replays approaching uh, a particular ratio. And it's uh, not entirely obvious that this should be the case. I mean, we might think that uh, if an agent's performing a free action, what, what we'll get is a divergent series or a series exhibiting no pattern or that never settles in a particular relative frequency. I leave that aside for one moment. The second pivotal step is also open to challenge. Uh, it's not obvious uh, uh, why positing that the probability that Alice lie or tell the truth on the next replay is equal to 0 0.5 should be the only reasonable explanation of the relative frequency's convergence on that value. Uh, the reason for this is that there exist unlimited alternative accounts for this explanandum that do the work easily, equally well. Perhaps, for example, the probability that Alice will tell the truth on the next replay is 0 0.75 but it alternates between this value and 0 0.25. Well, then you'd get half truth replays and half lie replays as well. Uh, or perhaps it varies over a wide range of values, the average of which remains 0 0.5. And they, if that's possible, then we might think that the value of 0 0.5 for the next replay represents only a reasonable subjective probability, uh, but one that need not correspond to reality or to the objective probability in the world. Now, I think Van Inwagen can reply to at least that point, because he uh, could say, well, objective probabilities have to be grounded uh, in some concrete state of affairs. And according to his thought experiment, the state of the universe is exactly the same at the start of each replay. And so we might suppose that the objective probability that Alice lie or tell the truth has to be the same at the beginning of every replay as well. In that case, since uh, it seems the probability has to be on average 0 0.5 to explain the uh, outcome, the convergence on half truth replays and half lies, it's got to be 0 0.5 every time. That's the only value which will get you that average, if it's the same every time. Now, a full assessment of uh, Van Inwagen's thought experiment would require lengthy discussion. And in, to, in order to avoid this, I'm just going to suppose that, for the sake of argument, that he succeeds in establishing premise two. Uh, I, I'm going to accept that, uh, on some sense of objective probability, it is the case that undetermined events are governed by objective probability. And maybe that's appropriate, because uh, the topic I'm supposed to be discussing is whether quantum mechanics provides the room for free personal action. And I take it that we tend to think that uh, quantum occurrences, undetermined quantum events, are indeed governed by objective probability. So suppose we accept premise two of, of the chance argument on this reading. If an event's undetermined, then it does in some sense, it is in some sense governed by objective probability. Uh, where a curse by chance is read in this way, premise one will be the claim that if an event is a free action, then it's not governed by objective probability. Now, this thesis has some intuitive appeal. 
It's tempting to suppose that if Alice's action is governed by objective probability, then she has to somehow yield her own control over it. And that's what Van Inwagen seems to imply when he says that her action will have an objective ground for probability of 0.5 and there's nothing more to be said. We might think that it's as if nature flips a coin about a minute before Alice performs her action or makes her decision and thereby determines which decision she's going to make. But despite its initial appeal, premise one on the objective probability reading is open to challenge. So first, although there may be intuitive considerations that count in favor of the premise of premise one on this reading, there also exist intuitive considerations to the contrary. For example, we often predict those actions that we take to be pr freely performed with some degree of success. And sometimes we do so by assigning to them probabilities. Uh, but in everyday life, we don't suppose that this encroaches on people's freedom. Uh, the claim that a defendant's actions were effectively determined by circumstances has often held up in court. But the claim that the defendant's actions had some objective probability seems highly unlikely to do so, especially if it was below 0.5, especially if it was extremely small. A more focused response to the thesis that free actions can't be governed by objective probability uh, might point out that probabilities evolve over time. If Van Inwagen's thought experiment is successful, it shows that there's a 0.5 probability that Alice will lie or tell the truth a minute before she decides how, uh, how to act. But that probability might evolve differently from replay to replay after they run forwards. It's not as though nature flips a dice a minute before she makes her decision determining the outcome. Indeed, for that reason, it seems that the objective probability that Alice should act one way or the other a minute before her decision leaves a comfortable interval during which she might exercise control over that probability. Perhaps on some occasions, she steals herself against temptation, thereby raising the probability that she tell the truth to near one. And perhaps on other occasions, she gives in to weakness and lowers it close to zero. Uh, the only straightforward way to reply to this point would be by revising the thought experiment so that there's no time between the start of replay and Alice's action, in which case, uh, an interval in which she could exert control over the probability of that action occurring or not. But that move's not promising, for if the start of the replay is immediately before or simultaneous with Alice's action, then it's natural to suppose that she's already freely exercised over it whatever control she has. And so it seems you need to uh, uh, leave an interval because otherwise your replay starts after she exercises her free will. And uh, no one thinks that after you've made the decision, you can remake it by a, a backwards causation or something. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Some people probably do think that, but most, most people don't intuitively think that. Well, uh, there's a final move that might be made in defense of premise one on the objective probability reading. If Alice is really able to exercise control over the probability that she lie or tell the truth after the replay begins, then perhaps we might think it surprising that the relative frequency of lie replays and truth replays should consistently approach a particular value. We might expect Alice's freedom of choice to destroy any detectable pattern of that sort. But two responses can be made. First, as I mentioned above, Van Inwagen provides no justification for the thesis that the relative frequency of lie replays and truth replays should approach some particular value in the first place. And so if, given that Alice acts freely, the contrary is to be expected, then his description of the thought experiment is obviously question-begging. Secondly, it's possible to devise thought experiments that suggest that the fact that a sequence of undetermined events approaches some relative frequency is not at tension with the thesis that those events are free actions over which some agent has full control. So a simple scenario that seems to motivate this judgment is as follows. Uh, in the below diagram, which hopefully will appear, uh, a labyrinth is formed by a series of forking paths. I know it's not a real labyrinth, they go in a 12, but you know. The paths divide in two at su successive junctures. A sequence of paths leading from one end of the labyrinth to the other, and perhaps the doors shut off the passages after one passes them, 
a sequence leading from one end to the other must take either a left hand or a right hand turn at each juncture. The point of this experiment is to give a simple uh, scenario in which the probabilities are easy. Obviously, it could be vastly more complex. Now, suppose that a random traveler progresses through the labyrinth. Perhaps it's a highly elastic body that's shot in from the starting point, or perhaps it's a person who flips a coin uh, or consults the decay of an atom in order to decide which path to take. It seems highly plausible that the relative frequency with which the random traveler takes left-hand paths and right-hand paths will approach roughly 0 0.5 as she progresses. At least I think that's highly plausible. And observing random travelers, we might propose a probabilistic law according to which the chance that a left-hand path is taken at a juncture is equal to the chance that a right-hand path is taken and is therefore equal to 0 0.5. But now suppose that a free agent, Theseus, enters the labyrinth in pursuit of the Minotaur. We might observe Theseus's, uh, well, right, we observe Theseus's progress through the labyrinth. Sometimes he rushes at the Minotaur by the path at which it appears, and at other times he takes flight down the alternative path uh, if his uh, approach doesn't look likely to uh, give him a good chance of defeating the monster. Well, as he progresses, it seems highly plausible that the relative frequency with which Theseus takes left-hand paths and right-hand paths will approach 0 0.5. Uh, you know, supposing the, lab the Minotaur doesn't have a limp or something that makes it always go left, uh, uh, supposing all things are equal, it seems it's going to be the same as for the random travelers. But Theseus is, Theseus is ex hypothesi, a free agent. And yet there seems to be nothing counterintuitive about the thesis that his choice of path will approach just that relative frequency to which the sequences of paths taken by random travelers approaches. And this seems to show that uh, premise one of the chance argument on the objective probability reading can't be defended on the grounds that sequences of free action should not approach a particular relative frequency. So even though Van Inwagen gives us no reason to suppose that uh, Alice's actions would approach some relative frequency, even if they do, it's far from clear that this is a problem for them being free. So it seems then that even if we do accept premise two of the chance argument on the uh, objective probability reading, which I'm not sure we should, uh, premise one is still going to look pretty counterintuitive and at least in want of uh, serious support. So since I do have time, I think I do, yeah. I'll now turn quickly to one final reading of uh, occurs by chance in the chance argument. Adorning or adorned by Caspar David Friedrich's uh, The Stages of Life, uh, which, which I can't think of any reference uh, to, to the content of the talk. So this final reading is drawn from Alfred Meller's work, Free Will and Luck. Meller offers a thought experiment which is quite similar to Van Inwagen's. Instead of replays of the same situation, however, Meller asks us to imagine two worlds with the same history up to a particular time. In one of these worlds, an agent like Alice performs a free action at that time, and in the other world, she does not. Uh, for any free action, if it's an undetermined event, there'll have to be a possible world in which it's not performed. This is why Meller's thought experiment seems to follow from a, a libertarian views of free agency. So Meller asserts that in this situation, nothing can count, nothing can account for the difference between the two worlds. And he goes on to say, if nothing accounts for the difference, then the difference is just a matter of luck. So according to Meller, the problem for undetermined events being free actions is that we're not able to say what accounts for their occurrence in one world when, in another equally possible world, they should not have occurred. Events that lack contrastive explanations of this sort, he proposes, are a matter of luck and therefore not free actions. Obviously, he says luck. Uh, I, I'm reading that as chance. So here is the chance argument for a final time on the reading drawn from Meller. If a free action, sorry, if an event is a free action, then it's not the case that it lacks a contrastive explanation. Premise two, if an event is undetermined, it lacks a contrastive explanation of the kind Meller describes. 
Therefore, if an event is undetermined, it's not a free action. Now, the term contrastive explanation might be somewhat confusing here. Uh, there's a, an article by Christopher Hitchcock in which he argues that we should have a more encompassing understanding of contrastive explanation that accounts for undetermined events as well as determined events. And so perhaps the libertarian would think that for this reason, premise two on this reading of the argument is false. Uh, but that response would be weak, I think, because Mel is obviously correct in thinking that there is some kind of explanation lacking. Uh, David Lewis characterizes contrastive explanations in a different way to Hitchcock. On his characterization, Lewis's, to ask why Alice performs an action in one world rather than the other is to request information about the features that differentiate the causal histories of the two worlds before the time of Alice's action. And whether or not that's the best theory of contrastive explanation, it's clear that we could ask for that information, and it's also clear that such information cannot be provided for undetermined events. So keeping in mind that it's Lewisian contrastive explanation that's at stake, it seems that premise two of the chance argument on the laxa contrastive explanation reading will be true. Now, where occurs by chance is read as lacks a contrastive explanation, premise one is the claim that if an event is a free action, then it is not the case that it lacks a contrastive explanation. And on this final reading, I am inclined to say that premise one is once again unconvincing. For like on the unpredictable reading, premise one seems now to be question begging that some difference in the past history of two worlds must explain why an agent performs a, a free action in one, but not in the other, is something that libertarians deliberately deny in asserting that free actions are undetermined events. Without some further argument, the libertarian can agree with Meller that such events are a matter of luck in this sense, but just deny that this conflicts with there being free actions. It's not clear what further argument could be given to show that for an event to lack a Lewisian contrastive explanation is in genuine conflict with its being a free action. In presenting his case, Meller implies that there's something mysterious about our inability to explain why an agent acts in a particular way this time in terms of some prior difference. Mysterious in much the way Caspar David Frederick's paintings are, he might have added. Uh, and so perhaps it's this mysteriousness that should give us cause to doubt that the agent acts freely. Um, well, the events that are undetermined uh, lack contrastive explanations is, I think, in some sense mysterious or, or might intuitively strike us as so. But it's doubtful that this can be appealed to in support of the thesis that such events cannot be free actions. And that's because, as uh, Hitchcock points out, it also strikes us as somewhat mysterious that events that are not free actions should lack contrastive explanations of this kind. Uh, so suppose the intuitive mysterious of events that lack contrastive explanations is common to both free actions and events that are not free actions. Well, if this is the case, it's plausible that we should follow Hitchcock in dismissing this intuition that they're mysterious as an instance of misplaced deterministic thinking, demons of determinism, he calls them. But alternatively, if we do treat this intuition as evidence against the possibility of free actions that are undetermined events, then we've got to also treat it as evidence against the possibility of undetermined events at all. And that would undermine the thesis that the physical, in, uh, rather, that would not undermine the thesis that the physical indeterminism posited by quantum mechanics provide sufficient room for free personal agency, it would just undermine the thesis that a true interpretation of quantum mechanics, or the best interpretation, will posit undetermined events. Now, we shouldn't in that case have a successful version of a chance argument against the possibility of undetermined free actions. Rather, we would have a reversion to the traditional argument from physical determinism. It would remain the case that if there were physical indeterminism, this might provide sufficient room for free personal agency. And in any case, we're unlikely to uh, reject such a highly successful theory, physical theory as quantum mechanics, 
simply on the grounds that we find it mysterious. Indeed, if we were going to do that, we'd have rejected it a long time ago for many other reasons. Finally, we might note that it's far from clear that there is anything very mysterious about the notion of a free action that lacks a Lewisian contrastive explanation. The necessity of making a decision without sufficient weight for either option, uh, for example, is a familiar feature of everyday experience. And it is, moreover, one that does not defeat us as it does burden's ass. And so for this reason, it seems to me the premise two on the, of the chance argument on this reading might well be correct, but uh, there's very little pressure for us to accept premise one once again. So as with the previous readings, when we give slightly more content to the notion of occurring by chance, it's unclear how the chance argument is supposed to succeed. I have a concluding slide which recapitulates this information. I've given four versions of the chance argument, each with a different reading of occurs by chance drawn from its proponents. On no reading are both premise one and premise two compelling. And this is accompanied by William Turner's famous picture of the Oxford High Street in celebration of the fact that it's recently uh, uh, funds have been raised to, to keep it at the Ashmolean in Oxford. There's a couple of asides I could make about whether it's really the case that quantum indeterminism uh, will manifest itself at the macro macroscopic scale of human agency or indeed at that of divine agency, but I think it's best that I conclude there. Thank you.